It is my pleasure to bring up our speaker this morning. I've known him for over 12 years and just found him to be the man he professes to be, a man of God, um, amazing uh, man of God. And uh, he is one of, definitely one of the young shepherds that God is raising up. And I sensed in the praise and worship today that God was speaking to many of us in here. And you say, well, no, I'm 45. I can't be a young shepherd. Oh, you're a young shepherd. You wait until you get older. You're a young shepherd. And so I want to just say it is my pleasure to bring up uh, my brother Ken uh, Villarreal, uh, who is going to minister the word today. Uh, just a wonderful and powerful man of God. Clear thinker, clear speaker. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Those words are always too kind. Uh, I feel like a kid in a candy store, if I can be honest with you. Just like exploring God. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Just thinking about God and the things that start coming to you in praise and worship. It's just, there's, there's just goodies everywhere. Right? And I, I don't want to mature out of that. You know, I know sometimes you might look at a kid and be like, all right, you know, you're you're 15, right? We should probably stop acting like that in the candy store, but not with God, right? I think we should always be amazed at just everything he does and how he does it. Uh, like Pastor said, my name is Kenneth Biadi. I'd uh, like to thank Pastor Don, Sister Marva. Just thank you guys for your labor. Um, just the further we keep going, the more evident it is and clearly you've seen the great labor that you guys have done. Um, I think if we're paying attention, we feel it and we see it. So thank you guys. Uh, I would like also like to say, uh, Pastor has said before, right, that he's homeschooled, homeschooled by God, and that that to me just sounds so cool, right? You know, God was your teacher, right? Doesn't that sound cool? Uh, so I, I would say I have a partial homeschool with God, but I also went to LSCJ, the Lavelle School of Christ Jesus, right? So it just it just makes sharing. With God's people, it just helps, right, to have gone to the Lavelle School of Christ Jesus. All right, the title of my message is Seeing the Unseen. Seeing the Unseen. Um, yeah, Pastor has said um, a while back, um, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm, I'm terrible sometimes at quoting perfectly, but that, you know, in, in, the lat in, in later days or in these days or in the future, um, the world was going to say there was a conspiracy going on because the church was going to be saying, this, everyone was going to be saying the same thing. And I, I think just as I, I know what my message is, I haven't shared it yet, but just the theme of today, the theme of last week, you know, it just seems to all be from the, the same vein, the exact same vein. So title of my message is Seeing the Unseen. Um, I'd like to talk just a, a couple of thoughts in my introduction is Foundations. You know, I've, I saw a documentary once about skyscrapers and, you know, these, whatever they are, right, 1,000, 1,200, I don't even know what the tallest one is, but these massive buildings of, I've never been a part of the construction or seen one of, like, the foundation, but in that documentary, I mean, it was impressive. I mean, the tons and tons and tons and tons of concrete and steel and dirt work, and so you walk up to a tall building and you see what you see and you're impressed right but really right there was so much more that's unseen you think about also a tree right these great massive trees that you see um there's so much more that you don't see that's underground so i'd like for us to explore a little bit of of what we see and also the unseen here with god another thought i had in, in my introduction was that uh true believers were headed towards a marriage right we're headed towards a marriage with god I just think that's something we should think about and ponder, right? Of of there's this, there's some there's something in store for you, right? There's something in store for you. All right, God's amazing in how He does things. I'm gonna get into my message now. Um, my thesis statement is: when you see God, you're changed. When you see God, you're changed. I, I'd like to talk today a little bit about Job, Job's story. So I'm gonna have to. It's a long book, so I'm gonna have to run a little bit. Um, before we get there, though, I'd like to read in Ezekiel. And just a little bit before this verse that I'm about to read in Ezekiel 14, uh, this is just a side note. It's talking about judgment, and I had a thought in my preparation of judgment is scary. 
right? It, it really is. I, I know we, we know, we should know this, right? That we are in Christ, right? If you're saved, talking to the believer, the wrath of God is not for you, right? That, that has already, his son took that for you. But there's still a certain judgment sometimes. And just, just looking at it, it's scary. All right. Ezekiel 14, verse 12. Um, yeah, verse 12 through 14. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when a land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it, and I will cut off its supply of bread, send famine on it, and cut off man and beast from it. Even if these three men... Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. So I would like to just point out here that these are distinguished men that are mentioned here, right? It said, Noah, Daniel, and Job. Right? That's some, um, just dis- they're distinguished men. So I would like to just frame that as I'm talking, I want you to know that I recognize that. I know I'm, I'm, I do not mean it. Uh, I'm just going to speak freely right but i want you to know that i know in my heart right these are distinguished men that god had done great things through and i recognize that and so i want to talk a little bit about job so the book i'm going to be quick i'm going to be quick this can be high level the the book opens up with god calling job a blameless man upright he fears god shuns evil right he gets a good account right an honest a true witness from god about about what he's doing right now on the earth and it, it just talks about where he's from, and just a little introduction about Job, about all that God had given him, all his great possessions and his wealth. And then it says that the sons of God, right, the angels came up to heaven uh, to give an account to God. So I don't know, you know, fully what that looks like, what their interval is or anything like that. I just know what the scripture says is they go up before God to give an account. And it said, and also Satan came up with them. And so the Lord tells Satan, oh, what have you been doing what's going on you know and he says i've been walking around the earth just walking about it and then god says hey have you thought about my servant job and um satan says well no (laughs) right you've hedged him right you have fenced him in you've protected job you bless everything that he touches everything that job does you know i cannot mess with job right one thing i'd like to point out there is is that came out of like Satan's mouth, right? Like it's documented here forever and all eternity, right? That when God wants to take care of something, there is nothing he can do about it, right? Like that came from his own mouth. And so, um, so Satan says, you know, I can't do, but right. You, you take away that hedge, right? You, you let me mess with him and his stuff. He'll curse you to your face. And God says, do as you wish. Uh, you can mess with his stuff. Do not mess with him. And so Satan just, just wanted, you know, pastors taught us here, we don't want to give him free advertisement and airtime, but we want to see his schemes. I think we, we want to see what he is, what he's about, and what he does. Immediately he goes out, right, and, and just steal, kills, and destroys. Like he didn't even have to think about it. Right? That's just what, that's just who he is. And so he, he left the presence of God and he goes out to Job and it says that the, there was a group of people that raided, I want to say it said his oxen and his donkeys. Right? And it killed all the servants. And then, um, it went, he went out and then he killed the, um, sheep. I think it was sheep and some more of his animals and all the servants. And then, uh, lastly, he goes out and it says there was this, this wind that comes down and it knocks down. I'm going to read it here. A great wind came and killed his sons and daughters. So then, uh, Job grieved. Um, you know, there's customs of the day and he grieved and he fell to the ground in worship. And this is what Job said. Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Yet he did not sin or charge God with wrong. I, I would like to pause here a second and just acknowledge, um, I, I don't want to just gloss over this part of how tragic and sorrow and how much pain was in that of that loss of life that day, right? Um, I just, I just want to make sure that I'm clearly conveying that's not something we're going to go over. Brother, brother Mark Rose, Roser's, uh, Dr. Mark Roser's message last week affected me, 
right? And so that's nothing that I can relate. I'm just being honest and transparent with you. I can't relate to that, and I don't want to, right? But th- that doesn't mean that some people in this room have not had great, great loss that's happened to them. Uh, but remember, the title of the message is Seeing the Unseen, right? So that's something that we've seen here, this great loss, the hurt, the pain, and we're going to explore it a little bit, uh, but we're, we're really looking at the unseen. And so... Uh, another day, it says the angels are coming back before God, and they're giving account, and God says the same, uh, Satan comes up also, and God says again to uh, Satan, God says again to Satan, he says, hey, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, skin for skin, it was in the article today, skin for skin, right? You only let me, you only let me mess with this stuff, right? Let me mess with Job, right? Let me really get at him. Right, let me get at him, and then he's going to curse it to your face. And God said, uh, he's going to curse it to your face. God says, uh, do, do, as you, do as you wish. Go, go. You just can't take his life. Right? You can mess with Job's body now. You just can't kill him. And so immediately Satan goes out from the presence of God, and he doesn't even develop right, you know, a chronic illness. He just goes and, and gets him with some boils. All from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, these painful boils all over his body. And so then, uh, I'm going to read now, Job 2, verse 11. Um, well, three of Job's friends come and visit him. I'm going to read it, verse 11. It says, now when Job's three friends heard all of this ad- adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bilidad the Shuhamite, and Zophar the Nehemahanite. And they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they raised their eyes from afar off and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept, and each one of them tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. And so... I'm not going to go into it here, but just in my preparation, my study, even their names are kind of cool, what the, what the meaning, right? God is just so awesome in the way he, he wants to show us things, reveal to us things that even their names are pretty cool. Uh, so uh, I'm going to, um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and, so then what happens next, right? It says that they go seven days, don't say a word to him, and they're sitting there. And now it comes into the, the meat of the book where there's a lot of dialogue. Uh, there's, there's a lot of words I, I wrote here. Uh, there's about 10,000 words in their dialogue in 700 verses. So there's a lot of words spoken. And so I want to, um, I'm not going to get into the dialogue Completely. I'm just going to summarize it. So Job's friends came to visit him, and they get a bad rap sometimes, right? And I think it's it's justified in one sense, and in one sense it's another. So what's going on here is Job is telling them, and I'm, I'm this is like 30 chapters, right? So I'm I'm squeezing it in a lot. It's 10,000 words. So what Job is telling them is God is against me. Right? I was blameless. I was doing all these, all these things for God. Nothing changed on my end. And now it's clear God has something against me. Right? He's doing something against me. And so then his friends start telling him, no, Job, God's perfect. He's just. He's awesome. He's mighty. You must have done something wrong. Right? Job's like, no, man, you guys aren't getting it, right? I'm telling you, I didn't, right? My heart was blameless and upright before him before. It's been like that now. It's just now he doesn't like me anymore, right? That's what he's telling And so there's great frustration going on between them and Job of, of he's saying, you guys are miserable comforters. You guys aren't helping me, right? You're just telling me that it's my fault. And they say, well, of course it's your fault because God doesn't treat the good like this. Right? God doesn't treat good people like this. He wouldn't do this to somebody good. He only do, does this to the wicked. And Job's like, well, maybe I'm wicked, but I was being blessed before. Right? So there's just, just not seeing the unseen. Right? Not seeing of what's really going on. And so then, uh, they're, they're having their, their, their dialogue there. And then, um, uh, 
So his friends, like I mentioned before, they get a bad rap sometimes, Job's friends, and I think it's justified in one sense. And what I would like to say as I was looking at it and, and summarizing it is they weren't wrong. They weren't wrong. The things that they were saying that they were saying to Job were true. Like there was true good things that they were saying of God, except it was incomplete. Their understanding, right? The has as far as they they could only give to Job as far as they had gone. Right? And so because they had not gone past a certain point, they were unable to comfort Job. Right. So there I think that's just a warning to us in that let's as we continue on this message, let's see. Let's see all of God. Let's see really what God is revealing to us that we may be able to help and be salt and light to those that God has placed in our sphere. And so um, this is now my I'm not excited. I still have time. And this is my this is the part I really wanted to get to. So. Uh, when you see God, you're changed. So here we get to this chapter, Job 32, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, with no warning, emerge, uh, emerges this fourth friend, right? So it was like sneaky, right? He, he's not mentioned anywhere, right? And comes this e Elihu. Elihu shows up. He was always there, but for some reason he wasn't acknowledged, right? Right, I, it, he wasn't even acknowledged that he's one that came from from afar, but he's always there, silent, listening. And all of a sudden, he shows up in this picture, right? And he has some words to say. And I'm going to spoil it here. He's a, a God loves pictures, and he's a type of Christ. So Job 32 verse 14. It's so so these. Uh, this is verse chap Job chapter 32. Verse 1, so these three men ceased from answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. It says, then the wrath of Elihu, the son of Bar-Rachel, the Buzite of the family of Ram, was aroused against Job. His wrath was aroused because he justified himself rather than God. Also, against his three friends, his wrath was aroused because they had found no answer and yet had condemn Job. So this guy shows up and he's got a problem with Job and he's got a problem with his friends. It says, he says, now because they, now because they were years older than me, Elihu, Elihu had waited to speak to Job. And when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, his wrath was aroused. So Elihu, the son of Bar Rachel, the Buzite, answered and said, I am young in years and you are very old. Therefore I was afraid and dared not declare my opinion to you. I said age to speak and multitude of years to teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in man and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. Great men are not always wise nor do the aged always understand justice. Therefore I say listen to me and I will also declare my opinions. Indeed I waited for your words. I listened to your reasonings while you searched them out what to say. I paid close attention to you and Surely not one of you convinced Job or answered his words, lest you say, we have found wisdom. God will vanquish him, not man. Now he has not directed his words against me, so I'm not going to answer him with your words. They are, they are dismayed and answered no more. So uh, he says here, uh, I've waited, I've listened. I, I thought, surely, right, God's going to be revealed here. And he said, they, he was not, right? He says, um, he says, that it doesn't necessarily mean when you're aged that you have wisdom of God, right? Now, this is not about an age thing, right? A young thing or no thing. He says it here. The wisdom of God comes by the Spirit of God, right? There is breath in the Almighty that gives men wisdom, right? We get that? That's the only place it comes from, the Spirit of God. And so in Job 33, uh, he says, but please, Job, hear my speech and listen to all my words. Now I open my mouth. My tongue speaks in my mouth. My words come out from my upright heart. My lips utter pure knowledge. The spirit of God has made me and the breath of the almighty gives me life. If you can answer me, send your words in order before me. Take your stand. Truly, I am your spokesman before God. I also have been formed out of clay. Surely no fear of me will terrify you, nor will my hand be heavy on you. Surely you have spoken in my hearing and have heard my the sound of my words saying, I am pure with tra transgression and innocent, and there is no inequity in me. And then, um, so this Ilohu goes 
And he now starts telling uh, Job, um, God is doing something and you don't see it, right? And then he starts telling Job, he says, God is all the time, I'm paraphrasing, God is all the time working, whether it's through a dream, whether it's through pain, whether it's through a messenger. He starts listing these things of God is always working in men's lives and it's always with one intention to deliver them. Right? He says to save them from the pit. And so he's saying that men are all the time marching, right? The day we're born, we have a destiny with hell. Man, that was strong. <laughs> right? We have a destiny with hell. Right? And God is always working to reveal himself, to reveal his answer. And so in this... Um, Elihu, he goes on this sharing by the Spirit of God what he sees God is doing and why he's doing it. And God has this purpose for Job. And then you know what happens next? It says that God answers Job himself from a whirlwind, right? So there was this revealing from Elihu they cause God to show up, right? Elihu is a picture of Jesus, right? There is no revelation outside of Jesus. And it's so clear in my head, right? God, Jesus Christ, comes to us and he wants to reveal to us, he does reveal to us, God the Father, right? Right? Elihu is a type of Christ. He is revealing the God of heaven. It says in Luke chapter 10, it says, In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and the earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight that all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and whom the Father except the Son, to the one whom the Son wills to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have have not seen it and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. God wants to reveal himself to you. And the only way to show you God was to give you his son. Right. This, this tragic, this tragic things that had come upon Job, right? These real things that had come upon Job, right? God's. So I'm going to read. This is what, after God reveals himself to Job out of the whirlwind and shows him who he is and everything that he's done and he's doing, this is what Job answers and says in Job 42. He says, I know that you can do everything and no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I do not understand, things that are too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of ear, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Verse 5 says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seen you, and I abhor myself. Right? So Job gets this, this revelation of God which I'm just going to say he didn't have the full revelation yet, which we have now, which God's heart and intention to reveal to men was his son. Right? Christ Jesus was sent to reveal the Father to us. There was no other way in which men can be saved. There was no other way for us, for us to have a relationship with God, right? To come into covenant with God, except God did something. So God did something himself, right? He sent his son, right? For you, that you may know him, that you may see him. And so in all these things that come against us and come to us, know that God has a purpose in mind. They're not errant, random things going on in your life. God has a divine purpose, which is to reveal himself to you more and more. God's purpose for you 
and all the things that come against you are to reveal himself to you more and more. So the things that you see and the things that you don't see, when you explore those unseen things, right, and press in and find out what God is doing, you're going to see that God is working for you. He's doing for you. He's moving for you. Doing great and mighty things for you. So the revelation of God in the Job story came from Elihu, right? That's just a picture, right? The only revelation that we, the only way for us to see God, to know God, is to know his son, to receive his son. I'd like to read here in closing uh, verse 12. It says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold on of that which Christ Jesus had also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize and upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's why... From this pulpit, right, speaking here, everyone says, keep going. Keep going with God, right? Don't stop, right? There's more, right? There's more. It, how painful it is and whatever's going on, keep going. Don't stop, right? Because there's a high calling on your life, right? The, the, place, the places that you are destined to stand before and the places that you're destined to sit are, are worth it. They're so worth it. They're so worth it. So in, in closing, when you see God, you're changed. So let us, let us as a body, let us desire to see God in every situation. And the secret here is find out what Jesus is saying. Study him. Look at him a little closer. Right? Right? And you'll find out how that fits for you. Like, you will see what it is that is happening to you when you study the face of Jesus. When you look to the face of Jesus. When you spend time with Jesus. It's a great mystery that has been preached, right, for decades here. With great simplicity and clarity, right, that Jesus is everything for us, everything to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for who you are and all that you've done. I thank you that your word is filled with these rich lessons, but they're all showing us Jesus and the way he loves us, his great care for us. Lord, uh, I thank you for the story of Job and the workings of that you had in his life, Lord, and that we can see here that through the hardest situations in life, God is not unaware. He's not uninvolved. He has not separated himself from it. He's in the midst of it with us, and he's working it out for our good. And so I pray, Lord, that your people, starting with me and even those that are in this local congregation with me, Lord, that we would see you in every situation and that we would respond appropriately to what you're doing. Let us see you, God. Help us, God, see you more and more. In Jesus' name, amen.